right, welcome again to today's webinar on understanding third culture kids. We wanna start by thanking Navy Child and Youth Programs for making today's webinar possible. Thank you all for taking our poll right there on your screen. We see that we have some professionals joining us today. Thank you so much for being here. We always welcome professionals to who work with military connected ch children to our parent trainings. And I think you're going to find the information and tips that we go through today very useful. Just note that our MSEC parent webinars are designed with parents as our target audience. Before we introduce ourselves, I just want to share with you a bit more about MSEC and our mission. The Military Child Education Coalition, or MSEC, is a nonprofit organization established over 25 years ago. Our mission is to to support all military connected children by educating, advocating, and collaborating to resolve education challenges associated with this pretty unique military lifestyle. In 2005, MSEC formalized support and programming for military connected parents so that they may be empowered, informed, and proactive in supporting their children's educational journey. We strive to deliver informative and interactive webinars that address academic, social, and emotional issues associated with the military family lifestyle. It's our vision for every military connected child to be college work and life ready. My name is Katherine Katowski. I'm happy to join you here. I'm coming in from the National Capital Region in Northern Virginia. I've been with MSEC since early 2021 as a parent educator and a trainer and a webinar presenter. I am also a proud military spouse and military parent myself. I've been married to an active duty soldier for over 17 years, and we have three military connected kids of our own. I have a ninth grader, a seventh grader, and a fifth grader, all girls. And I'm joined by Sonia Mulek, who will introduce herself. Sonia? Good morning, everyone. My name is Sonia Mulek, and I am located in Madison, Alabama, which is just outside of Huntsville, if you guys are not familiar with the area. Um, I have been married to an active duty Army soldier for almost 24 years, and we have two high schoolers. So we've been doing this lifestyle for quite a bit and have had several different moves. Our kids have definitely lived all over the world as well as with ourselves. Um, so right now, we'd like to get started with a couple of administrative announcements. At the end of the webinar, we would like to invite you to take our survey about today's presentation. We would really appreciate it if you took that two to three minutes it will require for you to give us your feedback. It is a key method that we use to tell our funders how we're doing, and it lets us know where we need to tweak some of that programming so we can continue offering those very best training opportunities possible for you, the military-connected parents that we serve. You're gonna see a chat box on your screen. We'll be utilizing this throughout, but you can also use it to ask questions and make comments during our webinar. So please feel free to use this feature, but please note that we encourage parents to interact and share free resources, but we do not permit advertising for paid services. Right now in that chat box that I mentioned, you're gonna see a PDF file that's titled Downloadable Resources. This contains the resources and information relating to today's webinar. Please know if you're joining us on your phone, you're not going to be able to download these resources, but if you private message either myself or Catherine, we'll make sure that you receive them today after we wrap up. Um, we also want to let you know that the webinar is being recorded, so you will be able to view it at a later date if you want to review the material or if you happen to experience any technical difficulties during the presentation. So let's start out by looking at our learning objectives for today. By the end of this webinar, we would like parents and care caregivers to be able to recognize military connected children as third culture kids, identify the effects of a highly mobile lifestyle on children's identity, understand the impact of transitions on military connected children's well being, and develop healthy strategies to deal with the effects of a highly mobile lifestyle. So, we'd like for you to use your reaction buttons right now and just give us a thumbs up if you've heard that term that I just mentioned, third culture kids or it's often referred to as TCKs. So we'd like to see if you guys are, are familiar with that term. It may be one that you've never heard of, or is it one that you've used before? Just give us a thumbs up if you have. Okay, we're gonna roll on to this next one. We'll keep watching for those reactions so we know if you guys are familiar or not. Um, Dr. Ruth Hill Using coined the term third culture kid or TCK in the 1950s. Dr. David Pollack defines a TCK as someone who spends a significant part of their life before age 18 accompanying their parents to different places due to the parent's choice or their career. 
Some characteristics are that they experience frequent transitions. They grow up living in or interacting with different cultures. This could mean they experience different languages, beliefs, traditions, values, and social expectations. The culture they grew up in is a culture or place different from that of their parents. So third culture children are experiencing different cultures while they themselves are growing up in between cultures. Um, Christopher O'Shaughnessy, a former military connected child, explains those three cultures as the first cult culture being a person's origins or where their parents are from. So it's those cultures they um, that their parents bring into the mix. The second culture is the environment a person has lived in outside their parents' culture or cultures. And the third culture, which our third culture kids were calling, is what's shared by people who live among those first and second cultures. It's a distinct way of life that's experienced by those who exemplify the first two cultures. So the first characteristic of a TCK that we want to explore a little bit further is that they accompany parents before the age of 18. Often these are your military connected families. Those families generally move every two to three years, either within the country or even overseas. Um, and over one third of the total DOD forces have children. So that totals that totals more than 1.5 million children between the ages of zero to 18 years old that are experiencing these frequent moves. And as we mentioned, some of them are in the country. 87.5% of our troops are in the United States and in its territories, but others are overseas. We have 6.3% in East Asia and 5.1% in Europe. So this um, mobility and change is a constant in the military lifestyle. Uh, frequent transitions are another characteristic of TCK. Those military connected families live in many different locations worldwide and they continue to change. Um, on average, a military child attends six to nine schools before high school graduation. There are numerous family separations involved in there as well. There could be deployments or just short-term trainings that the military spouse is away for. Um, military connected children experience loss in some cases. The loss of a loved one impacts military connected children, but loss for most means losing their familiar surroundings and friends or missing being a part of a team when they move to a new place. That last characteristic on our slide is the TCKs usually grow up in a culture or place different from that of their parents. So as we had talked about before, um, a lot of our active duty self-identify with a racial minority group, 31.2%. Um, those could be African-American, Asian, American Indian, Alaskan Native, Native Hawaiian, other Pacific Islander, multiracial or unknown. 18.4% identify as Hispanic or Latino. So there's a lot of different cultures um, coming into play with our third culture kids. For example, the parents may have grown up in Alaska while their children grow up in many different places. TCKs may have parents from different states. Um, that's a good example was my husband and I. My husband's from Chicago, a really big city. I'm from a tiny little town in Western North Carolina. So definitely different cultures and customs, even within the same country that some of our children are dealing with. Another example is that the parents could be from different countries. Someone from the US could marry someone from Germany, Puerto Rico, Korea, et cetera. The list goes on and on. Um, each country being brought into that mix would have its own distinct cultures, customs, and languages. These are all being meshed together into one family while adding in the cultures from wherever you may be living at the time. So this is what makes our military children third culture kids. Um, Catherine's gonna dive a little bit into the benefits of being a third culture kid. Thanks, Sonia. So there are some great things about being a third culture kid. Our third culture military connected kids have a lot of experience with change and they get that understanding early on in life that life is constantly changing. They also get a lot of practice in the fine art of learning how to blend in. They learn to be flexible, to adjust to their surroundings, to new people, to new locations. Our third culture kids also tend to be pretty adaptable. They learn those nuances of their new surroundings, again, as they're learning how to fit in. These are all life skills that we're not born with. And our third culture kids and our military kids get a lot of opportunities to to practice. They also tend to pick up social awareness skills. They meet other kids from different backgrounds. They get to observe different philosophies, different perspectives. This is helping them build those crucial social awareness skills. 
they also get to experience diversity. Our third culture kids get to experience different places, sometimes even around the world, different continents. They get to experience different languages, different cultures, entirely different lifestyles. They also, in this process, get to develop confidence. Military kids learn to build confidence as they're navigating and learning how to adjust to their different surroundings and to the different people that they get to meet. And they learn those cross-cultural skills skills. They living overseas or interacting with people from different cultures or even different backgrounds and regions within the United States is helping build those cross-cultural skills and giving them broader perspective. And sometimes our military kids may be even picking up some linguistic skills. Again, when they're living overseas or living within different regions within the United States. My family spent some time in Hawaii, and I was so surprised to visit school one day and find out that my pre-K student and my first grader could both sing the Hawaiian state song, which is in Hawaiian. And they could sing the whole thing start to finish. There are, of course, with those benefits, hand in hand come challenges as well. And our military kids and our our third culture kids definitely have some challenges. Big one, they experience that high mobility and change during their formative years when they're young. And the challenges of that high mobility, of course, are those frequent separations and the frequent experience of feeling losses. And Sonia's going to talk a lot more about this later, but they have these transitional experiences. And when we talk about transition, this is that passage from one place to change. It's the process of gutting through it to get to the other side. This can include things like deployments, geographic separations, from service member parents, moves, of course, changing towns, schools, having to meet new friends. Third culture kids may also experience questions of identity. That sense of identity is something that's formed often in the, in the first 18 years of a child's life. That's when they're learning, what does it mean to be me? And again, we're going to go into this more in depth a little bit later. But during those first years of life, that's when relationships with others are built. That's when they are developing that sense of purpose and meaning. And also, this is when a, a child's worldview is formed in the most basic ways. But for our third culture kids and our military kids, a lot of those relationships, they're having to reform as they're moving from one place to another, and their worldview is being developed in an ever-changing landscape. Another challenge of military third culture kids is mental well-being. In fact, the Military Teen Experience Survey in 2022 report found that Teens who change schools more frequently report, reported lower mental well-being. Those frequent school changes could have negative impact on our adolescents, especially. It hinders developing peer relationships. It presents a lot of academic challenges that we talk about in most of our webinars, particularly with transferring schools. And also, some of sometimes kids can miss those extracurricular activity opportunities. Perhaps an activity was available in one state, but it's not available at the next duty station, or the student arrives after tryouts have already happened or after the season has ended because the season happens at a different time than their previous school. Studies have also shown that more deployments or geographic separations lasting more than three months can have a negative impact on the well-being of children, particularly for younger children, ages 13 and under. So we have a question we'd love to hear from you in the chat box. It's a two-part question. First, we'd love to know, where are you from? If you met someone and they said, hey, where are you from? How would you answer that question? I know for me, it's actually a slightly tricky question. I would tell you I was born in Georgia and that's where my parents are from, but we moved to Chicago when I was two. And so I grew up in Chicago. So I'm mostly from the Chicago area. So we'd love to hear in the chat box, where, where are you from? Sonia, you'd mentioned, where are you from? I'm from North Carolina, from Western North Carolina. Yep. But if you I, ask my kids, well, we'll get to that in a minute. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the question comes for those military connected parents. Where are your kids from? If you ask them, where would they tell you that they're from? It's a much more complicated question. And I will tell you, all three of mine would give you a different answer. They would say, I, well, I was born in Tennessee, but I moved to Virginia when I was one. But I spent most of my life in Kansas, but I loved Hawaii. But now I live in Virginia again. So I don't know. So, Nia, what would your kids say? 
My kids claim Colorado as home. And that's just because we Mm -hmm. spent a significant portion of their childhood there. And that's the place where they're really first good set of memories, where they remember our house. They know our street, our neighborhood. They have friends still. So that's really where they formed their identities. And that's what they call home. They'll tell you they're from Colorado, but my husband and I are not from Colorado. So it gets very, very tricky. And every, I will, pretty much every military kid will give you a different kind of answer. They may list the states they live. They may tell you where they were born. Some will adopt their parents, the state their parents are from. That's the, what they will list as their home. Well, when we talk about identity, that sense of identity or that process of defining who we are, developing a personal sense of identity is crucial to things like building strong relationships, particularly starting within our families themselves. Also, it's important to developing competence and decision-making based on the assumption that the world is predictable and that we do have some sense of control. And kids make decisions knowing that they are protected, that they are safe within the context of their families. I see one response um, she says she's she says Door County, Wisconsin, a beautiful place, I might add, um, because they moved around the country, but not that, but not the state. My kids like to list the states they lived in and say all four time zones. That's a good one. My when my middle kid was three, she would tell people she was from everywhere. That was her one word answer. Um, someone said, I usually say we're a military family, so it's a tricky question. It is a tricky question. <laughs> and then we'll briefly list the journey. <laughs> Indeed. Um, in fact, are there, she said her military military group just talked about this question. Um, that identity is also crucial to achieving independence, understanding our own community and our own family rules. That's where we start when we start gaining our independence. That's when we start learning to make those competent decisions. And Listen, during the teenage years, experimentation with our sense of self is part of forming that identity process, you know, whether it's pushing the limits a little bit or trying on different proverbial hats to see which one fits the best as our kids are moving into adulthood. And also children develop a sense of identity through three main anchors, protect or or protective factors, their family, their community, which This one, community, especially for military-connected kids, often the the service member parent's branch becomes very much an ingrained part of their identity. If you asked my kids to tell them things about themselves, they would absolutely tell you that they are Army kids or military kids. They would use that term interchangeably. That becomes part of who they are, and people's reactions define who they are in the community and individually. And that third main anchor is place, you know, the place where they are. So the sense of self-identity in a traditional childhood experience might look a little bit different than a third culture kid's experience. So I want to note first, before we go any further into this, that we understand that every single family is different and faces different challenges. And when we use that term traditional childhood experience, we're just referring to non-mobile families um, as opposed to military families or other highly mobile families. And also, this is not a comparison to determine which one is better, so to speak. We just want to take note of how the process might be different for a third culture military child from their civilian peers, or maybe for those of us parents who were not, I was raised in a civilian family. So how my kids experience in their identity process is different even than mine was. So in a traditional family, typically the kids will have steady anchors and steady relationships. They're going to have their family where they observe their parents' work routine for years on end. Their activities are mostly steady. And the messages that traditional family kids are receiving that are, is that they are known and that they have this safe place, their home to, to express their feelings. And In this situation, the family is the most, well, for everyone, the family is the most important anchor for developing an identity. And kids feel like they know where they belong. 
Within community, a traditional family, this is where a child learns to live in a larger group, whether that's their school, they go to the same school all the way until they go on to middle school, which they, and they know which middle school they're going to, they know which high school they're going to. They may belong to the same sports team for most of their childhood. They may go to the same religious organization, the same church their entire childhood, and all those people and all those organizations know them. They, within their community, traditional family kids will have that sense of belonging where they get a chance to discover their uniqueness but accompanied by others they're not alone in this process also for place in traditional family kids they can become very attached to their physical location they have a hometown where they feel like they belong and have an emotional connection that hometown is very important to who they are and again it remains steady it becomes their place that they can go back to my parents left Georgia in their mid-20s, but well, all, all the way through my childhood, every time we went back to visit, my parents would say that they were going home, even when they hadn't lived there in 20 years. This, this hometown for traditional families will hold their entire history in one place or maybe only a couple of places. And children observe how their family relates to that community, where their family fits within that community. Now, for our military-connected kids, this self-identity pro process is a little bit different because it's often interrupted. They have those frequent moves from place to place. And certainly, military kids will form some attachment to their individual locations, but their whole history is not going to be contained in a single town, a single state for many of them not even on the same continent. They also experience all these changes, changes in their actual home, the house that they live in, the their schools are different, their friends are different, their neighborhoods. Military kids are often experiencing deployments or other geographic separations. They're, and, and for our military kids, they're when they're watching their parent, their service member parent go to work, they're seeing a lot of change in what that parent is doing. They may be going away for weeks or months or even a year at a time. Also, there may be family separations for a different reason, for child stabilization, where instead of the entire family moving, it's possible that the service member does what we often refer to as geo-batching, where the service member goes on to the next duty station, but the family stays put, often to stabilize children. So, And this is, again, something that uh, a military child may experience, and while they may be in the same place, their family looks a little bit different while their service member parent is gone. And in some cases, military kids are experiencing a wounded, ill, or injured service member parent who might be, it might be a visible wound or it might be an invisible wound like PTSD or a traumatic brain injury. So we would love to hear from all of you. How many of you experienced a traditional child, what, we, what we're calling a traditional childhood experience? Were you from one place? And again, we will feel free to use the chat box and, uh, and we'll keep moving on. Sonia? Okay. So these third culture kids that we're just talking about do experience frequent cycles of loss. They lose their house, their friends, their routines, their possessions, and not just once, but over and over and over with every PCS or every move. But they also experience hidden losses. And these are losses that they can't see or verbalize, but they still feel the loss. So for example, you may have lived in a location where you could ride your bike to school with friends, um, or you might be able to walk to an ice cream shop by themselves because it was a very close and a very safe neighborhood. Um, but when they move, they don't have that any longer. It may be something as small, maybe to us as the view outside the window. These are all hidden losses because they don't really know how to put those into words. So we have another question we want to put in that chat box for you guys just to think about, and please feel free to respond if you would like, but just can you think of any of these hidden losses that you've experienced? Because when you start thinking about them, if you've moved, if you've had change, there's probably a lot of things that you miss that it's really hard for you to verbalize. And I know thinking about myself, I had mentioned that we lived in Colorado for a really long time. And one of my favorite things to do was when I went for runs was to run through the fields. And I had a view of Pikes Peak, you know, it's gorgeous view. So when we left there, I could still go out and run. I wasn't losing running, but I lost my view. And part of that was what made my running so enjoyable. So 
you know, these are things that you wouldn't think about because yes, I still have the ability to run, but it's just that atmosphere I was running in. That's a hidden loss for me. Um, my kids could walk to school. That's something every kid usually wants to do. And they haven't had that opportunity since then. So that would be a hidden loss for them. Um, we have some in here. Um, okay. So we actually have one that had responded. Rosanna had responded that she actually misses not moving as an adult because she had moved with her dad who was in the army, but now she's a civilian and her kids have that traditional childhood. But for her, she has the opposite. She's missing that moving and um, she likes to travel frequently. So I can kind of relate to that because, you know, as military, you get in that cycle of moving every two to three years. So as you approach that two-year move, you're like, okay, it's time for a move. It's time for a move. Where are we going? And when you're not moving, it's very strange. It's because this is this typical way of life that you're used to. So I can see how that would be a hidden loss for you, Rosanna. Um, James says first language is Japanese. He was born in Texas, but he moved to Japan at seven months old and then to South Carolina in the 1950s, back to Texas, then to South Carolina again. So just a different type of um, childhood, not really the traditional one, just different. But definitely growing up with your first language is Japanese. That would be quite an experience, I'm sure. Um, my oldest used to speak fluent French. He doesn't anymore. He was born in a foreign country. Both my kids were born in foreign countries, but um, you know, he's kind of had that same experience. It wasn't necessarily his first language, but he spoke fluent, but he couldn't do any of it now. Um, moved several times when young, Charity says, dad was deployed when I was in second grade, but we didn't move due to military. He had combat related changes when returning, so had losses of what was. So get, losing that life, not by the choice that was their choice. That can be a really difficult loss to experience for everyone involved, the service member, as well as the family. Okay. And we've got another one, Patty. She moved around because her dad was in education. And that's something that we don't think about. There's a lot of people who move, not just military. I have friends in that situation. They're moving every couple of years as well. Um, okay. So that's good to know, but just realize that there are other people experiencing those frequent moves and those losses. Okay. And it helps to know that other families, not just military experience the same thing. It it is good to know, and it's good to be aware if you're a parent to know it's not just your kiddos that are going through that. There are others that feel the same way. Okay, so let's move on to um, a few other things that we have here. Another thing that I did want to mention before we move on from losses is that loss of status. Um, that's often a really hard one for our kids to deal with, especially as they get older and older. They're in a school or in a community, and they know exactly where they belong and how they fit in. They have their friend group. But then when we move, that changes and they may not be recognized for who they were or how they can contribute like they were at their previous location. So that's something to really be aware of that loss with your kiddos. Um, on top of that, you can also experience unresolved grief. So it's important to realize that grief is a natural emotional reaction and a response to loss, but unrecognized or unresolved grief can cause negative emotional and psychological responses at various points in your life down the road. Unresolved grief can stack up on highly mobile families as they move from place to place, and this can negatively affect well-being. So it's important to learn how to deal with that grief. Um, the grieving cycle, it does have five stages. There's denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. But please note, it's not always in the same order, and every family member is not going to be in the same stage at the same time. There's a lot of um, common reasons for this unresolved grief. A lot of people are just don't understand the process. There's also a lack of awareness. Things that are grieving can be intangible, like that daily routine that we talked about earlier where a kiddo could ride a bike to school. Um, if nobody recognizes the loss, the child cannot recognize it either. They may feel that they have a lack of permission to grieve. Uh, they might feel they aren't allowed to be grieving for things because we often hear it's normal for military connected families to move. So they might not realize that it's okay to be sad. It's okay to be upset. You need to make sure you give your children that permission to grieve. It may be an ambiguous loss, something that's very unclear. Uh, for example, a military connected child that has a deployed parent might not really know how they should feel about it. They haven't really lost the parent. They still have everything else in their life, like their school, their community, their routines, their other parents there, 
But the reality is that there is a loss for them in the routines and things that they used to do together with that absent parent. And they feel that loss, even though it's not permanent. So they, again, they need to be given that permission to grieve and acknowledge that this is a loss. During a move or a deployment or any type of change, there may be a lack of time to grieve. You may just feel like there's too much going on to take the time to, to grieve. The family's already stressed with just trying to fulfill all those immediate family needs. So you have to think about the emotional side too. You have to allow yourself to go through the process. Um, unresolved grief may also happen because of a lack of comfort. There's no one to help address the loss. In your other location, the they had all these supports around them who they could talk to, but a youth, especially older youth, may not tell parents or other adults how they feel. So the parent doesn't know to step in and help them through that loss. And they don't have those support systems that they had in place with peers or other trusted adults to help them understand that it's okay and to comfort them. There may be a lack of understanding just because it's not a tangible loss. Um, for example, your kids move across the country. All the technology we have today is amazing and fabulous. You know, my kids can still talk to their friends that we left in Colorado. They can still play video games with them. So in their head and in the parents' head, they haven't lost that friend. But yet it's not really the same as seeing them every day, hanging out with them, going to do things, seeing them in school. So they may just not understand whether it's okay. They've lost a part of that, but they still have the friend. So it's very difficult to know how to feel about that and how to process that emotion. Uh, to help resolve a lot of these feelings that we've talked about, about unresolved grief, children and families need opportunities to recognize those losses and name them. So it's important that you talk to your kids. They need to have permission to acknowledge what has been lost and understand this cycle of loss that we've talked about that's on this slide. This is all normal and it's okay. Um, we do want to move on a little bit from loss and talk about transitions. So Catherine had mentioned this earlier and let you guys know that we were going to talk about it more. So we want to jump into that. Um, previously addressed that frequent moves and changes can affect military connected children's well-being. Their identity process is continuously interrupted and they have constant feelings of loss. So these transition experiences are part of the human experience, but as we've noted, because of the way of life for military connected families and TCKs, they really become a part of that life, a constant part of the life. So a healthy transition is the ability to adapt and adjust to change positively. And that's what we wanna try to get to is that healthy transition. Now change and transition are different. Change is an external process or a series of events. For example, moving from one location to another. It's what happens to you. And it's often very fast and it's inevitable. But transition is the passage to the change, the in-between time. And it focuses on the psychological and the emotional changes that people go through from one point to the next. Oftentimes it can be a slow process. It's gonna take some time to transition. And a healthy process is not guaranteed. You have to learn how to work through this process. It is an internal event versus change, which we had said is external. So it's really important to understand this transition process because that can help to reduce negative emotional and psychological consequences. So on this next slide, we wanna talk more about this transition process to try and get to that healthy point. Um, during transitions, military connected children must adapt in several ways. It's physically, the body must adapt to things like new time zones if you're moving across the country or even into another country. Um, new climates, even elevation can come into play. If you're moving to a higher elevation, that puts stressors on your body that it has to adapt to. Cognitively, adjusting to new ways of doing things and sometimes diverse ways of thinking. If you move from somewhere like Washington, D.C., a big city, to Kansas, you're moving to a very different type of environment and a way of thinking. Or if you leave a base at Florida and you are PCSing to Germany, you're going to a completely different language and culture. There may be new responsibilities or activities that you're um, kind of dropped into the middle of that you have to figure out. So you have to process all of these. Emotionally, you may have feelings of excitement about the new place, but at the same time, you have feelings of loss and despair as you're leaving the place that's been your home. 
or you may face new ideas, cultures, and ways of thinking, depending on where you're going. There are five stages in the transition process. So we want to learn about these. There are involvement, leading, transit, enter, and re-engagement. So as experienced military parents, you can recognize that there's different stages, but you want to try and figure out how do you make these frequent transitions easier for our kids? Because as we mentioned, this is going to be a way of life. Um, according to Dr. Ken Ginsberg, how we respond to the discomfort caused by stress determines our state of health and well-being. So there are positive coping strategies that we can put in place to use during stressful times like transitions or deployments. And by using these strategies, you can help your children deal with stressful times in a healthy way. So Catherine's going to jump into that first stage of involvement, and we're going to try and look at some healthy ways to get through the stage. Thanks, Sonia. So starting with that first stage, involvement. This is the stage we would describe as feeling settled and comfortable in the place you know. This is your, you're good, you've settled in, this is your home, this is your community. You feel like you belong and fit in where you feel secure and safe. And you're not only do you belong there, but your community in turn recognizes you and you feel involved in your community. They know us, they trust us, and they respond kindly to us. That next stage is leaving. And this, when we're talking about, this is that first part of getting ready to leave, that realization that you're about to leave that place of comfort. And some common reactions to finding out that you're leaving, particularly for, for kids, is they may, that, they may unconsciously start that leaving process long before the physical departure. We start leaning away from our responsibilities and our commitments, our relationships. There can be an element of disengagement with the community. We stop signing up for stuff. Our kids stop wanting to do extra stuff. There can be some feelings of rejection and being left out. The people that are staying in the community, they might start planning things that happen after our departure, which of course we are left out of. And that can produce some resentment. How dare these people move on like everything's okay once I have gone somewhere else. And that resentment in turn can produce anger because exclusion is painful, even if it's not, it's no one's fault. You won't be there anymore. And as we lose these community ties, the community in turn starts to lose ties with us. The emotions during this stage are often very mixed. It is entirely possible to be simultaneously anxious about getting ready to leave and excited about moving towards the new place, to be sad that you have to say goodbye and super happy that you get to explore something new. Or it's possible that the new place already has some people that you know, some relationships there that you get to turn to. It's totally possible for, for us as adults and also for kids to hold both of those conflicting emotions at the same time time. During the leaving stage, you may notice avoidance or even denying some of those more negative feelings, denying and avoiding the pain or the fear or the sadness, or avoid living in the present and start focusing only on what's coming in the future. So we want to show you a brief video on what it's like to be a military child. It's a cycle every three years. You know, you get to a new school, you make friends, you kind of finally settle in, and then it's okay, hey, we have to go somewhere else now. I've been to three different bases, but I've been all over the world, basically. Is that it's hard because when you move, you like lose a lot of friends, and you're always the new kid at every new school that you go to. Their dad is deployed, or their mom is deployed, or somebody just moved away. I just got new friends, but I don't want to forget the old ones. Moving all around, it makes you adapt in different ways and meet new people. And um, so it's really broadened my sense of like who, like relationships and how to um, make new friends each time where I move different places. If you being a public school kid, you don't have to move all the time and leave your best friends, but. If you're a Dodia school kid and you have military parents, you and I have to move all the time. Well, and my family's very spread out too. So on my mom's side, both of her sisters are in the military also, and then on my dad's side, my two uncles did. So we're pretty spread out. So we're used to going around and everything. You just gotta learn that you won't be with your friends all the time, and you always have plane tickets. So you can always buy one of those. But you'll learn to make new friends uh, as you move on. You kind of have to like learn to like fight for yourself a little bit and you have to be social so you're not the one awkward kid 
sitting at the back of the room while everybody else is like talking. <laughs> it takes a lot of patience and it takes a lot of determination to not just give up. But once you put yourself out there, there's a lot more to do. And then, well, of course, with people being new, you have to be willing to get the one and know other people and want to communicate. You have to learn how to rely on yourself and you have to be able to process the world without others guiding you. Since I moved here, I've been a lot more culturally awakened. So I'll tell my friends back in the States, oh, I'm going to Venice for the weekend. They say, you can do that. I've gotten to see other parts of the world and how others and how other cultures interact and everything. I get to try a whole bunch of different food from different places and stuff like that, from being like a military child and having to move all the time. I remember on basketball trips, we'd see like refugees walking or just like a lot of different things like going on. And so it just opened my eyes. There's like more going on in the world than just the United States. I think that's, that's a huge opportunity to travel around to see different cultures and experience different things around the world. I feel like um, I've been introduced to multiple things and then because of that, I'm able to decide what it is I want to. I think there's a lot more like unity and sense of community because like me, I live on base and so I'm just around like everybody all the time and so I really get to know the people that I'm around and I just see everybody every day so I just kind of, there's more connection there. So I want to be a friend to people that have to go through that because I went through it myself and I don't want anybody else to have to like face that alone. The one thing I've, I've really noticed comparing here to a stateside school is there are a lot more Welcoming, welcoming. We're all in the same situation. We're all military kids. We're all moving every three years, sometimes four, five, six. But it's, it's just we're all in the same situation. We understand each other's problems a lot more. There's a lot of overcoming that happens when you're a military brat. So what I really like about this video is how much acceptance of their situation these kids show they acknowledge that it's not easy they acknowledge that there's a lot of new i heard the word new a lot but they also show a lot of cautious optimism there's a lot of looking forward a lot of looking for the the silver lining so to speak of even of the challenges so before we move on to the next stage, we want to talk about some tips to help during that leaving stage for some of those challenges. And the first one would be to inform kids about the upcoming move or change as soon as possible. I know how tempting it is to try to spare them for as long as possible of knowing that it's coming until the last minute, but it's really important to give kids that time that they need to process the change, to get closure, to go through the grieving process and give them that proper anticipation of the new, help them get to that place where they can look forward to the next thing. And this is true even of our little ones. So, and also, even if we tried to hide information from our kids, I think we all know kids know things. They can tell when something is up. So it's helpful to go ahead and just let them know and bring them into the process. Also, with respect to relationships, help kids resolve any of those, solve any unresolved relationships. Make sure they're leaving on good terms with, with people. And also, for those that they do have close ties and relationships, create tangibles that they can take with them to their next place, whether they are framed photos or notes or crafts. Feel free to invite people over to give kids a chance to spend time with them and say goodbye, to show their gratitude to folks for being friends with them and for having that relationship while they've been in that place. And part of having closure is acknowledging those blessings like the people in our lives and also to some extent mourning the passing of, of how that relationship is at that moment as you move on to the next place. Also communication, plan together how you're gonna communicate in the future with those people at the place that's being left, whether it's family or close friends. Talk, if you have younger kids and, and they're kind of in that place where they don't have phones or maybe they do or they have iPads or, or tablets or whatever, communicate with other parents to see how you can set up communication. And never forget about old fashioned letter writing. Kids can still get really excited about writing letters. And also for those really special close relationships, talk about how you might see each other again. It takes the sting away a lot if you are already planning the next time you'll see them, if that's possible, based on how far away you might be leaving. 
Also plan those last times. They Kids need reminders of the last time that they'll do something. So maybe it's the last time at their favorite restaurant or the last time at their favorite park. And make some time for those farewells. Say goodbye to the places and possessions that, help, that can help them to not have regrets later. Make a list as a family of the places that everybody wants to go and, and want to see to say goodbye to for possessions. A lot of us, when we move from one place to another, take this as a perfect opportunity to clean out all the stuff we don't want to take with us, especially when our kids have moved on to a different developmental stage while we are at that place. Before you toss all the toys, talk to your child first and ask what might be very important to them. There might be some of those things that our kids consider what we'll call sacred objects that help them connect from one place to the next. Maybe it's a stuffed animal that they bought while you were visiting a place or a pebble that they picked up or a snow globe that we as the adults may see as they don't care. It can go in the trash, but it's very, very important to the child. You may have to remind them that not everything can be a sacred object, but let them pick out those few that might help them connect to that place. Also rituals. When possible, if there are graduation parties or, or graduations or special parties or promotions, like promotion to sixth grade, attend those if possible, if you can make it to the last day. Now, we recognize that sometimes logistics just don't allow that because mid-year moves definitely don't allow that. Or you may be on a PCS schedule that doesn't, doesn't let it happen. But if you can, these rituals can really help with those feelings of closure. For the new destination, start researching ahead of time. Start looking at what the housing is going to look, look like. Look, scroll through all the photographs. If you have contacts at that place, and at some, after 17 years married to the Army, it feels like we know somebody absolutely everywhere at this point. Contact those folks that you know that are already there to help your family get excited about it and manage expectations of the new place. Talk about practical things like schools and activities, maybe even there are get a books that your kids can read about the new place, um, but make sure they're not expecting too much or that we don't oversell we're still going to be doing normal life there, so we can talk all about our proximity to Disney World, but if we're not going to be there every day, make sure we're managing those expectations, but still give them something to be excited about, because not expecting enough may also cause us to miss out on some of the resources, but just remember that every family member from the oldest to the youngest needs closure at this stage, and that includes you as the parents. Make sure you're also taking time for yourself to have that closure as well. And now Sonia is going to talk about the transit stage. Yes. So the transit stage begins the day you leave your place of comfort, your home, and ends with the conscious decision to settle into the new place. Please note, this is not the day that you arrive at your new location. Um, there's often a sense of chaos and stress during this stage. You experience mourning the loss of people and places that you left behind, and you have that realization that you're not going back. This is for real. Um, you might wonder if you've made a terrible mistake, even if it's beyond your control. Um, you often contrast and compare things with your previous location. There's also liminality. It's a period of transition. It's that in-between space. You feel a lack of belonging. And it's that space where it's neither this nor that. And it's really hard sometimes to see the light at the end of a tunnel. You may have a lot of different feelings and emotions. You can be happy, sad, excited, all at the same time. And each family member has a unique experience and emotions during this phase. Um, for example, a service member may move first and begin working immediately. So they're immediately connected and engaged and meeting new people while the family may move later, maybe after school finishes. So when you arrive, they're already connected. They're already part of that new community and you're still trying to find your way. Um, the family may still be struggling to find schools or new jobs. There may even be a deployment or a training soon after arrival while the parent and kids are still trying to settle in and find their way. And you know, I remember that we moved to a foreign country and my spouse deployed three weeks later and here I am in a completely foreign country. And this was one of the first times I had been so far away from everything I knew. So, you know, you're all both going through different experiences at the same time and having a lot of different emotions. And that's perfectly normal. Um, sometimes the spouse doesn't start looking for a job until the kids start school and feel more settled. So, 
the spouse, the active duty spouse is already engaged. The kids are in school and engaged. Yet as a spouse, you're still floundering a little. Um, this in-between stage can last a long time for some. It can take a while to travel through the transit stage, and that's totally normal. There are a lot of worries during this time. You may worry about health or personal safety. Finances are a big one. Moving is expensive. Um, your kids' well-being and safety may be a concern depending on where you are. There may be new expectations. For example, if your spouse is in command, you may be expected to take over that spouse's club, yet you don't know how anything really works at your new location yet. Um, it can all feel very overwhelming. You're just living in survival mode at this point, and sometimes you forget to stick to those normal routines that soothe you and your children. You know, that may be having quiet time for yourself or story time with the kids. Some people forget about exercise and taking care of themselves. Um, you have to remember to stick to those routines that create some type of peace in the family. It's also common for family members to overreact at this time. Family conflicts can emerge more often and can seem that they're apparently for no reason or over things that never really mattered before. Everyone can just be more irritable and prone to tears. Uh, normal things like cooking and cleaning can cause stress. So there can also be some disappointment during this time. All the connection with what you had in the past seems gone. And maybe the present, the new location is not quite what you expected. And um, some children can become resentful. In this stage, there may be a lacking of a support system because you haven't formed those new relationships yet and you're not quite sure how you fit in. And then on top of all these other feelings, self-esteem can be severely affected. Children feel they have to relearn things again. They have a totally different school with new routines and might be completely different. It's difficult for children while they're already going through the self-identified identity process to try and figure out who they are and where do they belong in this new location. As mentioned before, they may lose status. No one at this new location knows their history, their achievements, their capabilities, their talents, their areas of expertise. They have to reestablish all that. And they're facing these challenges at a new school. They're the new kid. They have to enter established inner circles of friendship. And with doing that, you're risking rejection. That's really hard. Rejection can lead to loneliness, anger, feelings of disappointment. There may be learning gaps. If you moved mid-year and your old school hadn't covered a concept in math, but your new school's already covered that and the kids all know it, this can really affect your self-esteem. So just remember, this is a very can be a very volatile time with emotions. Everyone is going to be a little bit more prone to emotions and, you know, feelings of maybe self-doubt. So just realize this is normal. So with all these negatives that we talked about and all these challenges, let's look at some healthy strategies to help us get through that transit stage. Awareness, just being aware and knowing about this stage. You can talk about it. You can talk about it with your kids. Of course, it's not going to be possible to avoid all the chaos, but you can assure, reassure your children that it's a normal stage and it's going to pass. You know, you're going to get there. You're going to figure out your place. You're going to be able to settle in. Every, you're going to learn the routines. You know, you'll find your friends. Just let them know this is normal. It's totally normal and it will pass. Um, Recognize that mourning is a part of transit. This is the period of adapting to the changes created by the loss. Help your child make that conscious, conscious decision to look at and acknowledge what they've lost. As we've said before, tell them it's okay to grieve. Acknowledge what they've lost, especially those hidden ones, and then focus on moving on to the next stage. Expect to that grief from your children. Help them name the stages they're in. Are they in anger? Are they in denial, bargaining, depression, acceptance? That's those five stages we talked about. Don't force the grief. They may not be as sad as you think they were going to be, and that's okay too. Let them know that we all feel emotions in different ways, and they shouldn't feel guilty if they're not sad about it, or if they are sad and their siblings not. It's okay. Everybody experiences these emotions differently. Um, allow for some physical expressions of mourning, maybe sharing stories about how they feel. They can write them out. They can talk to you. It's comforting to them just to know that you're there to listen to what they're going through and how they're feeling. Um, encourage them to find creative methods to express their emotions. Sometimes that may be drawing or photography. 
maybe singing, praying, dancing, find what works for your child. Share with them the things that you're thankful for, including those tough times. Remember that life can still be celebrated even when we're mourning something we lost. So look for those positives. Even when everybody's sad and frustrated, you can still find the positives in life. Acknowledge and honor the past and remind children that each piece is just a part of their bigger story of life. But keep encouraging them to look to the future and the memories that they'll make at their new location. Um, Some possible ideas that you might want to do to start looking into that new location is just take a pause. You've got a lot of chaos going with moving. Just find some time to explore your new location. So take your family on a walk around your new neighborhood. Who knows? You might run into a friend for them or, you know, a doggy pal for your dog to walk with. You just never know. Um, A great thing to do is put some fun snacks in the car, put everybody in the car and drive around. Look and find out what all's there. See what your kids get excited about. If they see that really fun ice skating rink and you didn't know they ever had an interest in ice skating, then maybe you can research that and um, schedule a trip to that. Or you might just stumble upon a really great science museum in your new community. Maybe it's just a sports field. Maybe they didn't know they played lacrosse there and they see kids playing lacrosse. So now they're excited. Um, You might get excited about some local shops or some activities. So just take that chance to get out and explore your new location and try to bring the family with you so you can see where do their interests lie and what are they excited about. Um, So now we've talked about that transit stage, we want to talk more about the entering stage um, with Catherine. Thanks, Sonia. So entering stage starts the day that we consciously decide that we're ready to become part of life at that new place. When we finally stop fighting it, we realize that the past is gone and we want to figure out how to become to belong in the new place. So we start reaching out to others and maybe taking some risks because life doesn't feel quite so chaotic. We've hopefully at least partially settled into the place and realizing that it's time to become part of the community. Even though, even though, even once a child starts moving into this phase, that doesn't mean they don't still feel kind of vulnerable. But even in that vulnerability, we start feeling ready to reach out and forge new connections. So some strategies for healthy entry. First and foremost, plan ahead. Again, as I mentioned earlier, find out if there are other people assigned to that duty station or find out if there are families at your at the service member's unit, whether you're the service member or your service member is your spouse. Find out if there are individuals there who are intended to welcome the family to the unit and use those social media networks. Find the spouse's group, find the military family groups and connect with other people that way and find out what people are doing for fun or maybe even where people might be meeting up. Be proactive. When you meet someone at the park who has kids the same age as yours and maybe they hit it off, plan to get together again. Consider being part of parent teacher groups or homeschool programs if that's if that's applicable to you. You just to listen and learn more about the community, look for sports and activities, find some mentors to help you acclimate to that new location who can explain all the all the unwritten rules or the fun cultural things that aren't necessarily something you can look up, but find someone who's been there who can talk you through it. This helps ease that transition and look into to active mentoring programs for students. Programs like, or student ambassador programs at schools in particular, like the MSEC student to student program, which is intended to welcome new students to the school. All new students, not just military kids, into the school, show them around, make sure they have a lunch buddy so they're not eating alone, but also look for spouses clubs or parent and child clubs. And remember and remind your children during this stage to be patient. This stage takes some time. It's not going to be immediate. And finally is that re-engagement stage. This is when you start to feel accepted at the new place. You know that your presence there matters. You feel like you belong and like it's like you're part of this community and you start to accept this place for who and what it is. This is when your new place starts to not feel new. It's just your place. It starts to feel like like your new home. So just some final thoughts as we wrap up today. The military and third culture kid lifestyle provides tons of opportunities for great life experience for our kids. They have adaptability, they learn social skills and resiliency. These are all wonderful benefits of being a third culture kid. And 
But these benefits are the result of challenges and transitions. And by understanding these challenges, we can, as parents, can help guide our kids to navigate the challenges of being a third culture kid and hopefully prevent or mitigate some of those adverse effects, particularly on their well-being. And we hope that you will take some of these ideas and implement them and use some of the strategies we talked about today. And that quote on your screen says, our home is not defined by geography or one particular location, but by memories, events, people, and places that span the globe. So we really appreciate your time today. And these last few minutes, we're just going to share some resources that MSEC has for you. Sonia? We would like to thank you for joining this webinar today, and we invite you to take our survey. We've got that in the chat box right now. I'll link to it, or you have the QR code on your screen. It's only going to take a few minutes, and we'd really appreciate that feedback. Um, if you do uh, go in through the QR code once in the survey, click on the webinar survey and type in that four-digit webinar code at 3224. Be sure you hit submit at the end of the survey. If you don't fill out our survey now following the webinar, you're going to receive an email invitation to take the survey. So we really appreciate that. We do use this tool to make ongoing improvements to our webinar series, add new topics of interest, and provide feedback to our funders. So please take that two to three minutes necessary to complete our survey. Um, we do want to let you know that if you have missed any of our previous recordings or webinars, we'd like to share the session, or you'd like to share a session, sorry, the recordings can be found on our website at www.militarychild.org under programs, trainings, and initiatives. Click on for parents in the middle of your screen and you'll find see the webinars we have to offer, or you can just click on the link that we've dropped in your chat box. We also invite you to check out SchoolQuest. It is an online interactive tool designed to support highly mobile military fam families and students it has many resources and tips to help students achieve academic success and will well-being. You can sign up today and it's free. And again, we have that link in your chat box as well. A great resource that we want to let you know about is this, if you have questions, concerns, or education-related issues for your military-connected child, our military student consultants or MSCs are the premier source to provide you with one-on-one -on -one help for all your questions. To contact a military student consultant, just email msc at militarychild.org. We've got that email in the chat box for you. Our well-being toolkit was developed for parents, school professionals, behavioral and mental health professionals, and community leaders. This tool is full of resources for all aspects of the military connected child's well-being, and we would love for you to explore it on our website and share it with others at militarychild.org forward slash well-being toolkit. Also, our MSEC 360 summits provide opportunities for cross-sector collaboration, idea sharing, and programming support. For more information, just use the QR code on the screen or simply click the link in the chat box. We want to let you know about our upcoming MSEC Global Training Summit and have you save that date. It's July 29th to the 31st in Washington, D.C. A really exciting program that's open right now is the MSEC Call for the Arts Program. We invite military connected children from all over the world representing every branch of service to share interpretations through art of what it means to be a military connected child. For more information, you can scan the QR code you see on your screen or click the link in your chat. Um, if you are a professional educator and you are interested in getting a certificate of completion, please complete the online survey. If you would like to receive a webinar survey for a recorded webinar, please contact us at research at militarychild.org. Uh, we also want to let you know about our upcoming webinars. Tomorrow, Wednesday, February 14th, we have alternatives to a four-year college. And then on Tuesday, February 20th, we have kids in the kitchen. You can either use those links I just dropped in your chat box to register. And just remember that all webinars start at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time. So right now, we'd just like to say thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. Um, we'd also like to give a special thanks to the Navy Child and Youth Programs for making today's webinar poss possible. Thank you to all of you for your interest and your participation. Catherine and I are going to be here for a few minutes. If you have any further questions for us, be sure you to type those in the chat box and we'll try to respond or link you up with somebody who can answer those questions for you. Thanks for joining us today.